Thank you very much. Um, so a little bit of a back, my background. I used to be a quant for uh, hedge funds and investment banks for almost 20 years, and everything ended with Lehman Brothers, and now I'm running my own uh, data analytics company with a few products out there. And um, I'm going to talk about one of the most interesting products I work. I did about $10 billion worth of these sort of deals that went to the capital markets. And these are very exotic assets. So monetizing data, basically, securitization of data. So cat, catastrophic cat bond. It's a very, it's a highly structured form of uh, security whose uh, default is not triggered by a credit event, but by a natural or man-made disaster. And it doesn't have any correlation with the stock market. So it's very attractive as a part of a portfolio because it helps the returns of your portfolio. To, to this day, um, there are several types of this risk, risk that has been securitized. Some of them are earthquake, hurricane, weather, wind storms. There was a terrorist attack bomb. And there are talks about oil spills, satellite launches, and all that. So the way this works, and I have to give this about 10 minute preview of this because this is a complex topic and I'm gonna put a, a lot of code out there so you need to understand the mechanics. Otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I need to explain a little bit of, of the background, the rationale for this sort of structure so you understand the code that I'm gonna show you. So basically, investment bankers, what I used to do, we set up something called an SPV, which is an offshore entity that is created with the sole purpose of insuring somebody, a corporation, a country. This SPV they set up offshore doesn't have any money, so it issues bonds to the capital markets. The bonds then are put in a collateral account to wait for either the event happening, the earthquake, the hurricane, the catastrophe, or the maturity of the bond. So if the event happens, the insurer gets the money or all or part of the money. If it doesn't happen at the maturity of the bond, the, of the, bond the investor gets the money back. And in the meantime, the, the money is held in an account investing in AAA securities or US treasuries. So there are many types of structures, but we're gonna talk about the parametric because it's the most transparent, the most quantitative, the most data intensive. So the parameters that trigger the default of the bond are all physical phenomena that can be measured, that can be quantified. But there are some concerns because the event may happen, let's say the earthquake, and the losses are greater than what the bond is gonna pay. Or it could be the case that the earthquake happens and there are no losses. So there is a windfall profit for the insurer. So it has many advantages over regular insurance because you know, everybody knows that when an insurance, insurable event is triggered, the insurance companies usually have to uh, measure the claims, observe, and there is a, lo a long development period before any claim is paid. But I forgot to ask a question. How many of you work in finance or hedge funds? So I have an idea, okay. And physics, anybody? Or engineering? Okay, so it's more or less. I prefer if we leave the questions uh, later because there is a lot of stuff, okay? So we're gonna be seeing the calculation of a parametric bond. This is gonna be in 30 minutes, we're gonna try to do something that takes usually three or four months of calculations, at least 10 years ago. So there's a lot of information here. So a, par a parametric bond, the parameters that are observed are the magnitude, the epicenter, and depth. At least two of these three parameters. And there are some intermediate steps. So there has to be an analysis, a time series analysis of the historical earthquakes, selection of area, and a calculation that is very important called probability of survival, which is something borrowed from credit derivatives. 
Terrorist attack, windstorm, and temperature, they have different types of uh, parameters to measure. For example, terrorist attack is a mortality risk, landmark damage, backstop limits. So to understand how an earthquake uh, it compares to other type of a catastrophes, I put together this chart. And it shows on the left, in the left side a scale from 2 to 10. 10 is just end of the world scenario, earthquake. But the equivalent millions of pounds of, uh, or billions of pounds of uh, TNT release. So you can see here, for example, the Hiroshima atomic bomb is about the same or was about the same as the Kobe earthquake of 1995. And then we have the Chile earthquake of uh, 1960, which was 9.5, one of the, or probably, the, I think it's the highest on record. And the frequency of earthquakes is on the center axis. So you see that the, these big earthquakes happen less than one a year, once a year, and the other ones happen a lot more. So let's analyze this real deal, and, and we're gonna try to replicate it in a different part of the world. So in 1998, Tokyo Disneyland was trying to get insurance against an earthquake happening in Tokyo. So they, ha they have exposure to earthquake risk. And at that moment, they were looking for insurance from regular insurers, you know, AIG, Swiss Re, Munich Re, all of those guys. And the rate they were charging was 10% rate online. It's very simple. You want $100 million of, of protection, you have to pay 10% of that in premium. It's very expensive. So is there a solution in the capital markets? This is the first bond of this type that you know, we issue, quants issue, which bypass insurance companies completely. So Tokyo Disneyland, a set up, an SPV in the Cayman Island was set up called Concentric. Concentric doesn't have any money, so Concentric issued bonds to the market for $100 million and the money was put in an account, waiting for, again, the event to happen or the maturity of the bond. So this is what happens. The issuance amount, the issuance amount was $100 million and obtained a BA1 rating from Moody's and BB plus from S Standard & Poor's. There's, those are equivalent ratings. And the bonds paid at that time 3.10% over LIBOR rate. And this is basically the structure, which is very interesting because it looks like a throwing darts on the dartboard. So the latitude and longitude of Tokyo Disneyland is used as a reference point. And then the quants, the structures set these ratios of 10 kilometers around the Tokyo Disneyland, then 50 kilometers, and then 75 kilometers. And then we set up this sort of table that says that if an earthquake of 6.5 happens and it's in the center, then the investors lose 25% or $25 million. The, then the, the whole structure unwinds and it ends, the deal ends. And as you can see, the scale goes up for earthquakes, uh, the payouts increase dramatically for earthquakes right there because the damage is highly correlated to losses in Tokyo Disneyland right there, but as you move away from the center, the losses, the earthquakes had to be very powerful to have an effect in, in, in the red dot. And that's basically the work of, of the quant. You know, you had to work on these moles until you find the right balance. And there is an equation that relates all of this to what the bond should pay. In a no arbitrage, set, arbitrage setting, but it's very computer intensive. I'm doing it 10 years ago, 15 years ago in C++, and a front end in Excel is just a nightmare, but it, get, it got done. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this in Python now, and it's amazing. Like an hour, you can do a million simulations. So it used to take three days for me on a cluster of machines to do 100,000 simulations, three days. And now we just numpy a million simulations in a few seconds. So let's see some of the code and how this works. So here, just lo loading all the uh, libraries. The most important is NumPy and uh, Pandas, 
my own library, uh, CPI, stats, the rest is just formatting stuff. So here, I just, and this has been, I made this model very generic. You just type the name of the city or country and it, it, it retrieves all the information. So here, using this uh, geolocator, G code, we find the, the X, Y coordinates of El Salvador. And I had, there is a caveat here. The information I'm gonna be analyzing is as of 2003. There is data from 2003 to now, which is not public, so I cannot use that information. So I'm, we are gonna step back in time and price this one as, to, as of 2003 because I had complete information. 2003 to now, yes, I could show you privately, but <laughs> this is a public forum, so. So we. No, it is not. So here, um, this is going to get complicated here. Scrolling these here. Huh. One. I guess I had to. I cannot scroll this because of the map, the size of the map. So right here. OK, so let's forget about the map. It's not getting in the way. So I set my start time of 1900 and the end time is end of uh, last year. I'm gonna retrieve all this information from the US Geological Survey, but we're gonna do the analysis as of uh, uh, 2003. So here we connect using the request, request library to the US Geological Survey and we request all this information. We get the information and I get rid of all this data that we don't need to have a cleaner. And this little equation here basically is gonna calculate the distance between the epicenters of earthquakes and the city of San Salvador. I chose the city of San Salvador because as an actual deal I was pitching to the government of El Salvador 10 years ago. And it's in the Pacific, uh, it's called the Pacific Ring of Fire, a lot of geological activity, and uh, usually when these small countries, Latin American countries, get hit by, by a hurricane or an earthquake, the impact on GDP is 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of GDP, and sometimes in the small islands you can see cases of 100 percent of GDP. So these are huge catastrophes. Just imagine something happening here in this country that has an impact of 100 percent of GDP. That's horrible. It's the end of the world. So. The problem with these deals is that they are very quantitative and you have to pitch this to decision makers that are usually not, you know, programmers who know anything about programming in, some, in many cases. But you sometimes find very competent staff that understands what you're doing and they do. And some of this got done after two, three years of basically education, like meetings like this, once every three months to hire and more senior and more senior people over time but they get done. So looking at the earthquake database from 100 years, we see that the max magnitude we have is a 7.8 earthquake. So here, I set my circles, just like in the concentric circle, the Tokyo Disneyland, 50, 100, 150 kilometers around the center of, of the town. And, uh, and I'm gonna plot, and here I'm gonna see the top 10. So we see that the top 10 the first one was a 1902, 7.8 magnitude. That was the epicenter in Chiapas, Mexico. And you see big earthquakes here. We compared to a uh, nuclear explosion, right? So here I was playing with this library called Base Map of Matplotlib, and I was able to create this very cool chart that shows uh, a zoom of this, this, the city of El Sal San Salvador is right here, and these are the circles I define above, and these black dots are the top 10 earthquakes in 100 years in the database. So we look here on the left and the right side, the distribution of that. As you can see, as the earthquake becomes more intense, stronger, then the frequency decreases. Here, I found this very interesting bulky library, and uh, we can just plot, look at the, the frequency of earthquakes. 
in, in, the, in the time series, but in a different, uh, from a different perspective. So basically, we're going to be designing a bond that covers these spikes. These spikes are the ones that are causing problems and are causing destruction. Remember that earthquake scale is not linear, it's a logarithmic scale. So a seven from two to, from one to two is not twice, it's 10 times. So here, you start analyzing the parameters. So here's the distribution of magnitude. Here's the distribution of depth because not many people pay attention to this parameter, but it's very important because you can have a 7.5 earthquake that is very shallow and has totally different effect than a 7.5 that is 400 meters underground. So you, you want to protect against the shallow ones. But this is the things I could not do uh, 10 years ago because it was difficult. Here I can see quickly a couple of lines of code. It looks like we are not dealing with we want single distribution, but it almost looks like a trimodal distribution. So three distribution overlapping. So we're not gonna go and try to break it down into the component distributions because we don't have time for that, but, but you start seeing things that it was impossible to see a few years ago. Same thing with latitude and longitude. So I like to use this library called uh, uh, Seaborn because it allows you there's some libraries that allow you to intersect distributions. So what happens with the distribution of latitude, with longitude, et cetera. And then here we can see that the depth is concentrated around 30 kilometers in depth. But here, this is very interesting. This is a trimodal thing that we saw in the histogram. The latitude, it looks like there are three main focus of earthquakes. These three, and so actually, you know, I can actually tell you what the center is, and we can send a geologist and find out what's going on there. Maybe they should have a measuring station right on top of that dot. But this is amazing what you can discover when you start doing data science with this sort of thing. So this is the market data. In order to price a bond, we need to know what our similar bonds price at. And this is all the bonds in the market. This is the head, the top five as of uh, 2003. And we have, for example, this one called Residential Re that uh, had a three-year term and the li pay LIBOR plus 5.76%. But when you read this documentation, because these are private placements, they give you two key statistics. One is called probability of first loss and the expected loss. So probability of first loss is, what's the probability, as the name implies, that the investor is gonna have one dollar of loss. That's the probability of first loss. And expected loss is when the loss happens, what's the average loss? Once you have those two values, you can plug them into an equation that I work with some guys at Munich Re, and it explains very well the pricing of the bonds. I'm gonna show that next. This chart is just the same thing, the same market, but it's showing the amount of the bonds as bubbles, so the bigger bubble was a bigger bond issuance than the smaller bubble. And here, this is very interesting. What we have here, the green and red line are corporate bonds in the United States that have the same rating as a cat bond. So this is very interesting. We have something that are equivalent in risk, but the cat bond is paying more to the investor. And this happened because the market doesn't really understand this bond. They're very quantitative. Not everyone has a quant or a data science to analyze this because you have to have a lot of expertise in many areas. So these sort of opportunities are, are, are out there. So why would, if you are a bond manager that can have double B bonds in your portfolio, why would you buy one corporate when you can buy this? It's allowed, you're allowed to buy it, but it has, a, you know, a, 3%, 300 basis point spread pickup. Another thing that we need to look at is the ratings by the rating agencies. So basically the rating agencies are telling you that if you have something that has a probability of 1.44% of happening, then that thing gets rated BB plus. So now we have almost all the elements. You know, We need to find out what's the probability of a 6.5 earthquake happening in this town and we can start looking at some other things. So this is the model. The model that gives you the spread is this power, power law equation. 
that uh, you calibrated the, the factors to the market. You can use uh, skid learn or one of those. Uh, no, no time to do it here. But as of 2003, these are the factors. Uh, gamma, alpha, and beta, which are right here. So now I'm going to go back to my data frame of El Salvador, and I'm going to calculate the PFL. And let's say we want to protect the country against earthquake of 6.5. So the probability of 6.5 is 0 0.008, less than 1%. And it goes up when you go all the way to 7.5, 7.6. Well, the probability of that happening is very small. So now with this, we do a Monte Carlo simulation. And this is where this is thing is amazing, uh, NumPy, because you can do a million simulations in seconds. And I'm going to take the parameters from 78 to 2003. So there are some theories out there that says that the frequency and the severity of earthquakes is increasing. So if we take the whole time series, it may not be representative of what's happening in the last 10 or 20 years. So that's what I'm limiting here to the last 25 as of that date. And then I do, I calculate what's the probability of a 6.5 earthquake happening. And it turns out that there is a probability of one event every 500 days. So we are going to do a hypothetical $1 billion uh, bond. And we are going to set up this table, just like the concentric deal in Japan. So if 7.5 investors lose 100%, et cetera. And uh, if you want to see that in a graphical format, it's the same thing here. You know? So you just go here, a 6.8 happening in the blue line, which is the, the circle, it represents a 50% loss or something like that. So here we do a million simulations. I simulate latitude, longitude, magnitude, and distance. And uh, this is the distribution of, let me go back down, of my simulated earthquakes red versus the real earthquakes blue. And we can see that in the simulated, we get some earthquakes of magnitude eight, which have not happened in real life. So if we plot all of these, into, uh, and here we just do the count the losses. We plug all of that, we find that the loss for this bond, expected loss of a billion is 7.5 million, it's not that much. We plug that into the equation I showed you before, the spread over LIBOR with the gamma and the alpha, that's the spread. So that bond, we just designed a $1 billion bond for a sovereign country, and that bond back then will have paid LIBOR plus 4%. How to get this to reality is a different story because a lot of regulation has to be in place. You know, the Minister of, the, of Finance has to get involved. The President of the country has to change regulations to create SPVs. It's a whole educational process. But I'm glad that I, I had the patience to work with these people and, and I got to do some of these deals. So now, uh, if anybody has questions. Um, it's a good question, you know. Um, I don't, I don't know, I know that uh, guys like uh, DE Show and some other super quantitative hedge funds, AQR, are using Python and these sort of libraries. I, I think JP Morgan is also has an initiative to use this. But uh, I don't think it's widespread. Uh, there is a, an Excel mentality still. It's a very close thing. There is no version control, you know. And uh, and these are these are very sophisticated models. But now that we have an IPython notebook with widgets and all of that, and you can put an IPython notebook on on one of these cloud things, you know, you can start seeing a lot of. Uh, I think you, you, the ones that start putting the investment, in the technology, and the people, banks can start issuing some bonds of this nature, generating new business for their organizations. Because it's a lot easier to structure one of these with these tools that, you know, with, what, with the closed system they use now. Um, there was an article very interesting uh, in November, uh, two days ago, Senator John McCain said that there is a 15 billion shortfall among some financial groups to cover extreme low scenarios of catastrophic, catastrophic risk.
And he was referring to JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs. So, you know, all of, all of these guys have commodity operations, and they have offshore rigs, and they are doing gold mining and oil. But if one of these environmental disasters happens, or one of an earthquake or something, the losses are a lot more than what the regulators are measuring right now. So there is now a new talk about how do we start measuring this thing? How do we hedge this? So it's very timely that you know this came after I have put together my whole pie data presentation. So I just incorporated this because it's very timely. And this is just a few of the deals that we're doing with similar methodologies. These are very exotic risks, but I got involved in all of this. And it's fascinating because it's a lot easier to do them nowadays than uh, 10 years ago, just 10 years ago. Any question? Any other question? With the acquisition of this data, I'm curious. Um, the US Geological Survey database is, is, is a free access. And they, some of the information for the bonds, you can get it from the specialized website called Artemis.bm. It's a publication that just does cut bonds and, and is based in Bermuda. But it's very difficult to get bid and ask spreads. Usually when, you, when the bank sells this bond, the buyer is one single buyer. So get, get hold of the details of that private placing is very difficult. What I have, what I show you, I have bid ask spread of all of those bonds. And I did the calibration because we were trying to put a deal in 2003. I, used, I was in Deutsche Bank, and, and we wanted to get the investor community comfortable with the pricing and, and the models. So I put together an Excel model that was passed to everybody, and then people started to plug with this thing. But in order for them to feel comfortable, they had to have the data. So that's the one I show. You want to update the values from now to from then to now. You you had to call friends, or you know maybe somebody in Bloomberg can give you the data. I don't know. It's it's not public information. Yes. Did you? I saw this sovereign, high sovereign risk. Yes. Um, I found so. I assume that that includes many other kinds of catastrophes. Yes, definitely. For example, what well, we all know that the U.S. is exposed to hurricanes in Florida, earthquake, earthquakes in California. China has a lot of earthquake risk. India the same. Japan. Italy has a lot of volcano. I remember pitching to the Ministry of Finance of Italy a volcano bond, and you know it didn't get done, but it was very interesting to develop an index just for volcanoes. They have a volcano in the southern part of Italy that every time there is a little bit of activity, the whole economy of the southern part of Italy goes, you know, goes crazy, and nothing happens. So it's just a bunch of smoke, but one day something's going to happen. And Italian reinsurers don't want to take the risk, so it's perfect for a cat bond. And all of these. Mexico did my deal. The deal I show you for El Salvador was actually done with the government of Mexico. They, they did the right thing. And all of these guys have heard the story, but they haven't done anything. Is it very difficult to apply the same techniques to different kinds of catastrophes? No. That's a good question. So one of the things I'm doing, Tweak, if you go and check out my website, Tweak is what you're going to see is that the firm that we are showing only is a light consumer business to consumer thing, you know, but we have a lot of B2B stuff and we are pricing all kind of exotic risk, all kind of exotic risk using these sort of techniques and, and, and some others. But yeah, I have done this for film. I have done this for music royalties. I have done this for, I'm using it now for, for social data and there is a lot of value there. Any other question? Jim, James McCarthy. James McCarthy. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Do you model counterparty risk in case there's a catastrophe that starts to take down financial structure? Well, you know, we have been approached by some group to do that, and it's fascinating because, you know, imagine that you are, let's say, J.P. Morgan, right, and then you have, let's say, your platinum clients or whatever. Let's say that uh, the, the, guys, the guys at the bankers are measuring all the things that they can measure and they can hedge. You know, currency risk, interest rate, whatever. But these sorts of risks, nobody's really integrating them as part of a you know, enterprise-wide risk management system. So what happens if an earthquake hits 
one of the facilities of your biggest client? How does it spread down to you? How does it affect the you know, supply, the chain of supply of products and services and all of that? Nobody's doing that. So this is some, some of the things we're starting to explore in, in my company in the private side. You're not going to find any of this in, in what you look up. You're going to find social search and a semantic search changing and some deal thing, but these are things that are just starting, you know, they're just starting and they have a lot of potential. Any other question? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's basically, if you look at it, it's just data products, you know. All of this is data. You're not dealing really with any physical asset. It's just mathematical models, statistical models, and, and a lot of data. And then you can put value and assign probability to this and compare to real risks. Let's call it real, you know. So one of the fascinating things with this type of bonds is like, uh, a crash in the stock market can cause a default of a corporate bond just because of correlations. You know, it can drag a big thing in the stock market can drag a bunch of corporate bonds. We saw that in 2008. But they cannot cause an earthquake. Right, and so that's fascinating because the money is isolated from any event. It's a remote enti bankruptcy entity thing, an SPV, and you can have a financial meltdown, but none of that is going to cause an earthquake or a hurricane. So it, it's a good thing to have in a portfolio. Don't you think that's what justifies its higher interest rate when compared to like a corporate bond, where it's like there's yes. no way to kind of measure when these events occur? That's right. That's so nobody really knows. If, if, if you go to the, the chart, you see that the spread is there. Yeah. So. The spread is, is usually because it's perceived as riskier. Uh, but it's a fascinating cl asset class by itself, you know? The risk, mathematically speaking, are the same as a corporate bond defaulting. But the spreads are a lot nicer for a cat bond. So it's a different asset class. What do you think is the better indicator of the asset class, the, move, the rating or the actual spread? Because I would think almost the, the rating is almost like a lag metric. It's a very good point. I think there is arbitrage there. I think the spray is a better indicator. Okay. The rating is just, they had to create a new, there was a very interesting case. You know, when, when I was a banker, I was trying to pitch this bond to CDO managers. You know? Usually the buyers of these bonds are insurance companies because they understand this stuff. You know? So if you're an insurer in Germany and you want exposure to earthquake in the US because you already have exposure to earthquakes in Germany, well, it's not that easy to come and write insurance for earthquake in the US because there are regulatory issues, right? So a good way to get exposure is to buy these sort of bonds. You buy an earthquake bond and you have exposure to earthquake risk in another jurisdiction, and now it's great. But while the market was just a bunch of insurance companies buying each other's risks, it wasn't gonna grow. So one of the things I was pushing is have countries issue this sort of bond instead of insurers, and it was done. So first thing accomplished, have a country issue one of those. Second thing, have other people buy this bond, not just insurance companies. And in order to have others to buy insurance, I'm sorry, in order to have other type of buyers buy these bonds, I had to talk to rating agencies, because you know what the rating agency said? This is insurance. So if you put it in an insurance, if you put it in a portfolio, it counts as an bond from the insurance industry. So I don't give you any credit for diversification. So you have to put the case mathematically. I talk to them, and these people are reasonable. You show them mathematically, guys, this is a totally different risk. It should have its own different class. So we did that. And so they say, OK, you're right. It's a different type of risk. So I give you credit for diversification. But it's just fighting with regulators. And you have to have the models backing your you know, point. Thank you.